I was uh, very much hoping that the Puffin Prize would be accompanied by a puffin of some sort, not uh, a live caged puffin that would entail responsibilities, bird dander, and guilt. And I gather that puffins, though silent when flying over water, are champion vocalizers on land. And anyway, a caged puffin would send the wrong sort of message. And I wasn't hoping for a stuffed puffin, God forbid, that would send an even worse message since puffins are still struggling to avoid the fate of their cousins, the great auks. This is something puffins and people have in common these days, being haunted by the fate of the now extinct great auk. Skim through any day's newspaper or pay even slight attention to our roller coaster climate of recent years and you're bound to feel slightly great auk-ish if you're aware of life on earth tilting, uh, you're aware of life on earth tilting in a great awkward direction. So I wasn't, I wasn't hoping for a stuffed uh, puffin, even though it's fun to say stuffed puffin. We're Americans, we're not Icelanders who pull puffins right out of the sky with big nets and in whose diet puffin meat figures importantly, who refuse to protect the birds and who eat puffin hearts raw. I figured I should mention this right now, now that you've finished dinner. It's a big Icelandic delicacy, raw puffin heart, or so I am told, and I wouldn't pa put it past them, the Icelanders, they are very interesting people, I suppose. I was hoping for a small painted effigy of a puffin to keep on my desk. They're very handsome birds, and they have wonderfully silly names. Since it was announced that I was this year's recipient of the prize, I've noticed how many people enjoy writing and saying puffin prize and working variations on the theme. Our uh, cinematographer in the movie that I'm working on down in Richmond, who is Polish, called out on the set the day it was announced, hey, congratulations on the prize, so what have you been puffin? <laughs> it's a very good idea to name a prize after a bird with a silly name. All prizes should have silly names or something pleasantly ridiculous attached to them as an antidote to self-seriousness. If you decide to establish another prize, perhaps you'll consider calling it the Great Auk Award. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to win that? I have always striven to cultivate in myself a determined, unappeasable resistance to deriving pleasure from receiving honors and winning awards. It's weird because I love receiving and winning them. I secretly hate everyone who wins an award instead of me, even people <laughs> who win awards for things I'm entirely out of the running for, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, for example. I have it out for Dan Schechtman, the discoverer of quasi-crystals and recipient of the 2011 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Hate is maybe too strong a word, really, but I am bummed out for a few humiliating microseconds of incomprehensible envy because it's so nice to win an award. Why wouldn't you want to win one every day? And how nice to win one for chemistry even if you're innumerate like me and haven't the slightest idea of why observations of quasi-crystals have produced a fundamental shift in our concepts of atomic structure or even what's quasi about these crystals. Perhaps it's because it's so nice uh, that I'm so mistrustful of awards. Anything this nice must be terrible for you or so my lived experience to the age of 55 has led me to conclude. I was surprised to be named as recipient of an award for creative citizenship as I would uh, have, uh, I was as surprised to be named as a recipient for an award for creative citizenship as I would have been to be named a uh, Nobel Prize winning chemist. I don't know a bit, I, I know a bit more about citizenship than about quasi-crystals, but that doesn't mean I've ever felt I'm a uh, prize worthy citizen, far from it. That this is not merely an award for citizenship, but for creative citizenship makes me feel like an ice skater who's just managed to circumnavigate the rink for one complete revolution without holding onto the railing, breaking an ankle or falling on his ass, <laughs> learning that he's made the Olympic team. I really can't pull off sports analogies convincingly, but you get the point. <laughs> that this prize comes with an ego deflating silly name helps. I'm not a prize winning creative citizen. I can remind myself I am a puffin prize winning <laughs> creative citizen. I, as a citizen, am henceforward joined to a short, stocky seabird with a fat head, a clown beak, and stumpy wings. I have to flap frantically to evade hungry Icelanders. That helps uh, deflate me. It helps reduce the degree of painful ego dystonic discrepancy between what I am as a citizen and what I think a citizen, an ordinary citizen, much less a creative citizen, ought to be. But then there's the matter of the check. I was 
really touched when Andy Breslau called me and told me I was the recipient of this award, touched and grateful, and of course mortified, but touched and grateful. I love the nation, the Nation Institute, and as I think I've made abundantly, perhaps even excessively clear, I love puffins. I also <laughs> love money, not inordinately, not to the exclusion of all else, not obsessively or inhumanly, but sure, I love having money, who doesn't? And Andy explained to me that along with this extraordinary honor, there would be a check for a lot of money to love. I am very grateful, really, for the honor, and I accept it with many reservations about my suitability because, as I said, I love getting awards, but I have some issues about the money. Please don't misunderstand me. I think it's wonderful that the prize comes with a check. I think it's absolutely great in honoring creative citizenship to provide financial support to those worthy of the honor and in need of such support as most activists and prize-worthy creative citizens probably are. We love money in the sense that we can't live without it, and it's fantastic when anyone in the progressive community acknowledges the need for cash to make progress possible, the need for activists and organizers, and I don't know why you're applauding, but great. Um, the need for activists and organizers and people for whom political work is a vocation to have salaries, retirement accounts, health insurance if they're to do the work that gives the rest of us some reason not to feel foolish when we feel hope. But I have some issues about the money. Issue number one, the money attached to this prize is so much that I worry it'll negate the ego deflationary effect of the aforementioned eponymous bird. $100,000 is a lot of creative citizenship and I'm a playwright. For pity's sake, I write plays and sometimes movies. What do you want from me? How could you do this to me? $100,000 for creative citizenship. Are you trying to make me feel sick with guilt every time I spend a day <laughs> making up people and giving them made up names and made up jobs and then setting them at one another's made up throats? Do you want to give me writer's block? Are you hinting at something like maybe I should be doing more, doing better, being a better person? I will gain weight, I will become insomniac, I will become paranoid, I will have to spend every nickel of this check on therapy sessions just to handle having cashed it. So, you know, thanks a lot. <laughs> Issue number two. I, I don't feel I can promise to spend this money in any way that will make it more possible for me to be a creative citizen. I will most likely leave tonight to continue in my life the same as before, making a living as a playwright, which is what I am not an activist, not an organizer, not a political philosopher or analyst. And for that work, to which I can give full credit for pretty much any creative citizenship to which I can lay claim, I am already sufficiently, sometimes more than sufficiently, remunerated. That work will go on after tonight as it has gone on before. If what I've done has contributed in some way to the general good, and I feel my future ability to write anything of value somehow depends on really believing and clinging to that if, if my writing has been of use to the good guys and an irritant to the bad guys, then I'm already so overtopped with good fortune I really don't need any more. My successes and failures as a citizen, creative or otherwise, will go on being generated by the same dialectical torment as before. I can hope with, uh, uh, I can hope with more citizen successes than in the past and with fewer citizen failures, but whatever happens, I can't see how it'll be because of your breathtakingly generous gift, and I don't feel that I should profit from any successes I have as a citizen. The whole point of citizenship, that second vocation incumbent upon all of us, upon all people fortunate enough to be enfranchised, or semi, demi, or quasi enfranchised, upon all of us who are fortunate enough to live our lives in a still functioning, if extremely imperfect, functioning democracy, and all democracies are extremely imperfect, in which the notion of citizen, the word citizen still has meaning, power, and value. The whole point of citizenship is that one admits to a personal stake and to the potential derivation of benefit in giving to and sacrificing for the community. One recognizes oneself in the community. One identifies an important part of the self, a part that deserves tending and nurturing and attention, even therapeutic attention, as much as does the selfish self which of course receives infinite attention, tending, caring, and nurturance. When we step into our citizen selves, we step into that part of our lives, our souls, that exist only in relationship to others. As a citizen, one occupies that part of one's life, soul, self, that is at least as communal, collective, social, and contractual as it is monadic, individual, replete. 
Citizenship, in other words, is not simply a duty, though of course it is that, nor is it merely a privilege, though it's that too, it's a blessing. By which I guess I mean that there is beauty, grace, magic, charisma, charm, in the old fashioned sense of the word, charm in citizenship. It's a gift handed down to us from generations of forebears who thought and fought and struggled and died to create this thing we inherit and advance, this recent numinous evolutionary phase of humanity. I feel like I have to say, since Reverend Jackson is sitting here, that um, uh, I think it was in the 1984 uh, uh, campaign when you made the speech on television and I watched it and I think it changed my life. And you said, you know, to people who are thinking of not voting, I'm now gonna do a terrible imitation of you, you said, don't walk away from that vote. Don't walk away, people died to give you the right for that vote. And I thought that was uh, one of the great moments in American political oratory, and I've always been hugely grateful. I wish I was a better citizen. I wish I took better care of this blessing, this gift, this manifestation of my indisseverable connection to the human community and to life itself. I wish that every day. I know that I haven't been an especially good citizen because the world would not be the cacophonically shrieking miasma of misery and wickedness <laughs> and ecocide and greed grown so monstrous that even greedy monsters must be ashamed of it, of how transparently, pornographically, their bloat is asphyxiating, crowding out and crushing the human in them. If I'd been a good citizen, a creative citizen, I wouldn't have spent my adulthood in exile from agency, from political effectivity. If I'd been the sort of citizen I daily wished I was, I would be looking back at 55 on three and a half decades of progress on building from the accomplishments that preceded my birth towards economic and social justice, towards an end to poverty and gross social and economic inequality, towards education and cultural vitality and pluralism and multiculturalism, towards internationalism, rather than the holocaustal global transmogrification that's been the history of the world in the time during which I can reasonably accept a share of the blame. Here's what I blame myself for, being comfortable with powerlessness, being disdainful of compromise, disdainful of impurity, disdainful of strategy, of luxury, luxuriating in a fantasy politics that's an expression of purity, of self, of my own pure self, of failing to recognize the egoism of disdain, of being impatient rather than patient, of plumping myself with criticism rather than tempering my political soul with discipline, of expecting others to solve problems that I have done nothing to solve, of living not with hope but with fantasies bred out of revolutionary romance. What better use of a happy, celebratory occasion like this than to compromise the abyss of one's failures? To what better use might any gathering of progressive people be put than collectively to flagellate ourselves for the many ways in which we've dropped the ball? Or, if your tastes don't incline towards the masochistic, what better way to while away an evening than to spin deliciously scary, coherent, plausible, grand narratives of how it's all gone so very, very wrong? Don't worry, don't panic, I won't do that now. I'll save it for my next play, which I hope you'll all come to see. But before you have a chance to do that, I haven't started writing it yet. I'm busy working on a movie, and even before you get to see my movie, which is about Abraham Lincoln, we're going to have an election. The movie will come out after that, during the end of the year crush of movies hoping to get nominated for an Oscar, another award with a silly name, though no one seems to notice that, at least not insofar as it's manifest in ego deflation or perspective. I hope long before the election, we progressive creative citizens take stock of ourselves and begin to create something. I think this is the moment. Real creation, from a writer's perspective, doesn't begin with the first line of a play, hard as that is to get down on paper. Anything can happen after that, so although it's terrifying to write the first line, you don't really commit to creation until you write the second and the third line, until fantasies of the perfect play, the play that's going to be better than Hamlet, fall to choices, compromises, fall to action taken, to the admission of limitations, of possibility, of scarcity and community. For every step taken after a promising beginning is a step out of one's solitude, out of one's solitary purity, and towards the fertile, febrile dishevelment of democracy, of community. In 2008, we commenced under perfectly hideous circumstances the writing of a new and critical chapter in American and world history. We reclaimed the most plausible practical instruments of agency, of power available to us. 
which is not to say that government, the federal government, is not implausible and impractical and unwieldy and to madness as a means of effecting change, but after many a costly slip and mistake, we decided, almost all of us decided, that we had to reclaim the government in the name of progress, and we did. And then, or so it seems to me, we retreated from the possibility. The discomfort and danger of power back into despair, disdain, distrust, impatience. It seems to me that we are in the process of failing as citizens to create, to build on what we've made. We're failing to find the faith that citizenship, which like all contractual things, turns for its ultimate surety to ineffables, is predicated upon. Maybe it's because I've spent the last five years working on making up a plausible version of Abraham Lincoln, that utterly implausible man that I've caught through his life and words and the inexplicable fact of his existence that I've come to believe that electoral politics is, as he put it, the last best hope we have. All of which is to say this, and this is what my whole speech was going to be about, but instead maybe I'll write an essay and submit it to Katrina for the nation. We <laughs> must, must, must hang on to the Senate. We must, must, must recapture the House. We must, 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 must re-elect Barack Obama the President. We must re-elect Barack Obama as President of the United States of the reality-based community. And he is, I think, a goddamn great President. Yes, I said it, a great President. A great president is not the same as a great progressive. A great president is a plausible progressive who achieves things, which is very hard to do in a democracy. It's always hard to do in a democracy, and which President Obama has done, but we can fight about that later. Someone recently uh, said to me that, um, in fact, several people have said this to me, that uh, uh, the only thing Obama cares about is getting reelected. I think that's nonsense, but even if it's true, it's something else Obama, me, Puffins, and everyone else who doesn't want to keep the great Auk company and the great beyond have in common. <laughs> Does anything matter more to you than reelecting Obama? Whatever that thing is, if you really care about it, you'll make sure Barack Obama gets reelected. So, back to the money. Uh, here's what I intend to do. I think one reason you people were lovely enough to deem me worthy of this award is because of what happened last spring when CUNY's John Jay College of Criminal Justice offered me an honorary doctorate and then, well anyway, it all worked out okay. So, for the sake of my soul and my psyche, and in the name of creative citizenship, I'm going to use this mortifying, beautiful money uh, to establish an endowed scholarship at John Jay. I was, I was, um, I was, I was dazzled by the, I was, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I was dazzled by the students I met at John Jay last year at commencement. They're as impressive and promising and inspiring and awe-inspiring as the CUNY Board of Trustees isn't. Um, <laughs> they're people who are committed to think about law and order within larger context, to understand law and order socially and politically and progressively. I'll let you know the specifics of the scholarship as soon as we've set them up. I was thinking of calling it the Jeffrey S. Weisenfeld Scholarship for Creative Citizenship, but I think maybe not. Maybe I'll find an appropriate bird um, as soon as these details have been worked out. But uh, I thank the Nation Institute and the Puffin Foundation for letting me know what it feels like to give $100,000 away. It feels very nice. And uh, I want to thank my husband, Mark Harris, for getting me through last spring. And, through all of this, I think it's clear from the past 10 minutes that his job is not an easy one. I, I want to thank Oscar for his beautiful introduction and for the blessing of his friendship and our ongoing creative co collaboration. And I want to thank the Nation and the Nation Institute uh, for two decades of interest and support that's been of much more importance to me 
helping me maintain faith in the necessity and usefulness of writing and of work and of struggle than I suspect my often elusive, ungrateful behavior has given them cause to suspect is the case. And I thank you all, the Puffin Foundation, the Institute, Andy and Katrina and Victor and everyone here for this delicious, nutritious, undeserved, but very gratefully received and accepted honor. I'll strive to be worthy. I'll fail, but hopefully not too badly. And I promise to strive. Thanks. Yeah.